Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, as Terry has mentioned, I'm going to talk about unfolding phase shifts and managing for change. And as you'll see from the bottom of this slide, various elements of this work has involved numerous collaborators. Most of our knowledge of phase shifts on coral reefs comes from the Caribbean, um, starting with this work by Terry, uh, where he showed that on Jamaican reefs, um, uh, the benthos was typically dominated by live coral cover in the 1970s, but by the 1990s, it had shifted to dominance by macroalgae. And that trend has continued. So a paper in uh, Tree last year by Roth and Mumby demonstrated that there's much more evidence for phase shifts from coral to macroalgae in the Caribbean than the Indo-Pacific. And if you look at just cover estimates, in the Caribbean, there tends to be low coral cover and there can be quite high macroalgal cover. Whereas in the Indo-Pacific, there tends to be quite a high range in live coral cover, but not necessarily very high uh, macroalgal cover. So the evidence base for phase shifts in the Indo-Pacific is, is poorly reported and is uh, potentially questionable. So I want to, in the first half of this talk, uh, go through some work we've been doing in the inner Seychelles, where we've been looking at reefs uh, through time following a major coral bleaching event. So the Seychelles was one of the worst uh, impacted locations globally for the 98 bleaching event. This uh, figure on the left shows um, the extent of damage from the 98 bleaching event. Um, and you can see the Seychelles lost about 90% of their coral cover in that one year alone. Now, we were quite fortunate uh, in that Simon Jennings had been working in the Seychelles in the mid-1990s and had collected very comprehensive data across 21 reefs across the entire range of the inner islands uh, looking at, at uh, uh, benthic cover, structural complexity, and a whole range of attributes to the fish community. Sean Wilson and I have been going back to the Seychelles since 1998 and monitoring uh, you know, what, what Im Im impact the uh, bleaching event had on the reefs and looking at uh, you know, dynamics through time. In 2005, so after the bleaching event, there was very little coral cover on all the reefs, but, but the reefs were in, in, in very different conditions. These were three dominant conditions that I took photos of when I was there. Top left, you'll see um, a reef where a lot of the underlying physical structure of the reef is still maintained, and there's a lot of fish there, but coral cover was pretty much 1 or 2%. Bottom left, there was very little underlying um, you know, robust physical structure. The corals collapsed, and we've got a two-dimensional rubble field with uh, very few fish. And in the bottom right, macroalgae was beginning to proliferate on some reefs. By 2011, this was a paper that Sean published last year, we looked at um, you know, what was going on with, with potential recovery, and one of the best um, or the strongest patterns we found was that the rate of change in live coral cover, so the, the increase in coral cover at these individual sites, was correlated uh, with the change in macroalgal cover. So where macroalgae was expanding on these reefs, coral cover just w wasn't coming back at all, and in fact it was actually declining on some reefs. So that gave us the idea that you know, reefs in the Seychelles were going on very different trajectories following this bleaching event. So we've now been looking at that in more detail, uh, and we've looked at the community composition of the reefs through time. So this is a principal components analysis and ordination of uh, benthic composition through time. The black dots are the 21 reefs in 1994, and the open symbols are the same reefs when we've monitored them in 2005, 2008, and 2011. If we just look at the data from 2011, I've just colored the, the symbols here, you'll see that some of the reefs in blue are now recovering and, and the composition of the reefs is very similar to, to how it was before the bleaching event. Whereas other reefs colored in red here have now drifted further and further away and are, are very different from, from how they looked in 98. So if you look at the distance for individual reefs through multivariate space, so not through the bivariate space, but through the Euclidean distance through multivariate space, uh, of reefs through time, you get an indication of how far displaced they are from pre-disturbance condition and, uh, and, and whether they're beginning to recover or drifting further and further away in terms of community composition through time. Now that metric can be used as an axis. We've used it here on, on, on the y-axis of this plot, the distance from pre-disturbance condition, to get an idea of whether reefs are, the composition of reefs are changing through time recovering back to how they, how they looked in 94 or drifting further and further away. And if you plot that just to visualize the data with the dominant uh, biotic uh, organisms on the reefs, the live coral cover 
and a macroalgal cover, you can see how these dynamics are unfolding through time. So this is how the data looked. So in 2005, you can see the distance from predisturbance uh, condition, as I just uh, outlined. And then the, the, red, the red line is, uh, is, is plotting percent cover of macroalgae and the blue line percent cover of coral cover. And you can see that the reefs that are, are further and further away from that predisturbance condition are, are, uh, are becoming dominant, dominated by macroalgae. And the reefs that are coming back to that predisturbance condition are dominated by coral. And if you look at this through time, you can see these dynamics unfolding. So on this figure, the, as the lines become darker, that, that's going through time, through those years. And you can see that uh, about half the reefs, about nine of the 21 reefs we survey, um, the composition is getting more and more different through time. It's drifting further and further away from how the reefs looked in, uh, in the mid-90s. And, and macroalgae cover is expanding. And some of the reefs were getting 50, 60, 70, 80% macroalgal cover. And they're really turning into sort of soft sediment systems. Uh, the other half of the reefs, about 12 of the reefs, um, are, are moving back towards the predisturbance condition and coral cover is, is increasing and some of the reefs uh, are, are pretty much back to the same cover that they, that they were before the bleaching event. So we were interested in seeing if we could predict uh, why some reefs go on a trajectory towards recovery and others uh, are, are phase shifting to a different composition. We looked at a whole bunch of variables. I'm only showing you the four that came out as, as being useful predictors here. Interestingly, marine protected areas versus fished areas didn't have any predictive power in this. Um, the most powerful predictor was the initial structural complexity of the reef, which I showed you briefly in the, uh, in the photo earlier. Uh, I think that's a really useful metric. It's a real catch-all of a whole range of different ecological processes on reefs. And, and that had the strongest uh, predictive power here followed by the density of coral recruits or juvenile corals less than five centimeters diameter on the reefs. Herbivore biomass was important, as was depth. And we, we looked at this to try and get an idea if we could you know, look, at, look for cutoffs uh, in these variables when a reef is likely to go towards, uh, you know, return to coral cover or go on a phase shift trajectory towards macroalgal cover. And this is an example for structural complexity. Um, so, uh, if if uh, the value that we looked at, this visual technique that's being used uh, in monitoring programs all over the world now, uh, was above 3.1, uh, we had a 90% cert 95% certainty that a phase shift was unlikely to unfold and, and that the reefs were likely to recover. And we looked at this for the other variables, so we could, we could uh, you know, put values on the density of, of juvenile corals, um, herbivore biomass, and water depth. So, for example, for water depth, if, if reefs that were deeper than six meters were unlikely to, to shift to macroalgae, and uh, um, that makes sense, as we all know that macroalgae uh, does a lot better in shallower water. Now, we've then gone on to look a bit at the fish community. Fish, I think the role of fish in, uh, in, in these dynamics is quite interesting because they can be controllers of, of, of whether phase shifts occur. They can really you know, in, uh, involve important processes such as herbivory. But once a dramatic change happens in the reef benthos, we know that the fish community can, can be severely impacted. This is some work by uh, Karen Chongsang, one of my uh, students who's worked a lot in the Seychelles. Um, she's looked at a range of reefs from, uh, on, on the x-axis here, ranging from high structural complexity and high coral cover through to high macroalgal cover, those are orange sites over here, and looked at the influence of this uh, different benthic conditions on the fish community. And as you can see, the species richness of the fish community drops off dramatically, particularly when you go to those macroalgal dominated reefs. Uh, abundance of obligate coralivores drops off almost immediately as soon as you start losing that live coral. And she looked at a whole range of functional groups and found some very, really interesting patterns. We've now started doing this through time with the, the dynamics that I've been describing unfolding on the Seychelles reefs. Uh, these plots look quite complicated, it's, it's, it, but it's actually quite intuitive to, uh, uh, to interpret. This is a collaborative work with David Mio, who was uh, based at the center for a, for a while. Uh, so this is basically a measure of functional diversity. So it's based on the traits of the fish, such as body length and uh, a diet and so on. Each individual dot is an individual reef. And the open circles are the averages for, for, for an individual year. So the, the, 
plot on the left is, uh, are the sites that are recovering, and the one on the right are the sites that are going towards a phase shift. So the black circles are, are the data in 1994, and all I, want, all I want you to really take from this for the time being is that you know, if the, the blue circles, the darker circle is the most recent year again. You can see that the functional diversity on the, uh, of the fish on the reefs that are recovering is, is beginning to track back to how it looked in the mid-90s, whereas uh, the functional diversity of the fish on the reefs that are continuing to go on this phase shift uh, uh, trajectory is drifting further and further away. So the fish communities seem to be mapping what's going on with the benthos, which I think is, is quite interesting. Okay, so if reefs do become dominated by macroalgae, recruitment's not sufficient, um, the herbivores have, ha haven't done their job and uh, complexity is, is, isn't high enough. What can we do about that? How can we actually you know, uh, unlock this system or, or break out of these macroalgal dominated uh, states? And it can be very challenging because these, these uh, macroalgal dominated states can be very resilient to change uh, and very hard to break out of. So I think we can learn quite a lot from resilience theory, uh, which is typically focused on maintaining ecosystems in, in, in the desirable configuration, if you like. So in that theory, this is a typical um, figure that you may see. The top solid line could be, for example, a, a coral-dominated reef. The lower solid line could be a macroalgal-dominated reef. And what's quite common in, the, in, 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 uh, in this theory is that a perturbation or a shock to the system can actually flip um, from... Uh, flip flip you from one state to another uh, and, and, and lock you into a new set of feedbacks and, and, and you unfold into a new ecosystem condition. But when we think about reversing phase shifts, we typically, we typically focus on reducing the drivers of change, fishing, sedimentation, nutrients, and so on, uh, and we aim to get back to a certain point where, where recovery dynamics may ensue. And we don't often think about whether shocks and, and disturbances may be useful in, in reverse but there's nothing to say that, 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 that they won't be. So people have looked at the, the role of perturbations and shocks in a range of uh, other ecosystems, such as arid ecosystems, and found that they can be really important. So pulse uh, rain events associated with El Nino can, can, break, can break systems out of an arid state back to a vegetated state. On coral reefs, um, shocks may be useful as circuit breakers to try and remove macroalgae and, and, and start establishing uh, recovery processes. There's evidence that hurricanes, cyclones, or big storms can strip reefs of, of macroalgae cover. This is uh, work from Florida, where each of these bars is a different type of macroalgae, and two severe hurricanes came through in late 2004 and stripped the reef of macroalgae cover, and that persisted for, uh, for the rest of their monitoring. Similarly, some work from Hawaii found that a, a month and a half of unusual, uh, unusually overcast weather with heavy rainfall led to the complete loss of, uh, of macroalgae cover from about 60-70% down to 0%, which again persisted for several years as they continued to monitor those reefs. So these, these shocks are, may be opportunities to really remove that macroalgae cover and get rid of those feedbacks such as preventing successful coral recruitment or preventing fish from doing their jobs and, and have an opportunity for recovery. So this is a typical trajectory that, that we think about, reducing, uh, reducing those chronic drivers, be it fishing or, water, or improving water quality, to a certain point where algae might decline and coral begin to recover. But disturbances intermittently come along and, and, and surprise us in ecosystems and maybe opportunities where, al where algae, um, where algae is, is, uh, is removed. So in this bottom example, if the system has been um, uh, uh, prepared in advance, if you like, so if good management is in place, herbivore biomass and, and uh, water quality have been improved, uh, the effects of this shock may be harnessed and coral recovery may happen uh, far more quickly than if, it, than if we'd continued to slowly improve uh, water quality and a shock hadn't come along. So, this is all very theoretical, you know, this is just, uh, you know, the examples of reversing phase shifts on coral reefs are very thin. We, we know how to destroy reefs, we're not very good at bringing reefs back. Um, I think we're unlikely to harness the effects of shocks and reverse phase shifts unless we have really good uh, uh, management in place. Uh, the drivers of change need to be reduced. Marine protected areas, 
are one solution and they work well in some countries. Um, a lot of countries in the, uh, with coral reefs, marine protected areas cover a very small area of the total reef available. Uh, compliance is a problem and there's multiple stakeholders with very different objectives of, of what, what they want to, how they want to use the reef and the kind of management that they may be willing to accept. So I think reducing drives of change and, and, and improving management of coral reefs in order to try and uh, um, uh, improve reef futures is really going to need a much more uh, integrated socio-ecological systems approach. I'm an ecologist, as most of you know, but I tend to work with social scientists. Uh, I'm married to a social scientist, so I hear about it a lot, and, um, <laughs> which is a good thing. And, um, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's really enlightened me to, to realize that a lot of solutions to our, to our problems lie at the interface between people and ecosystems. Um, a lot of the solution space is, is in understanding and, and influencing how humans behave and, and, and the governance structures and so on. So on this figure, this is adapted by work, uh, um, adapted figure from work by Eleanor Ostrom. Um, um, if you look at the outcomes here, such as sustainable fishing or increased resilience uh, of, of a coral dominated state, there's a whole range of different subcomponents of, of, of this system where different management actions uh, may, may be appropriate. So in related ecosystems and processes, obviously um, uh, reducing land clearing or controlling agricultural runoff can be really important for getting on top of water quality. In the social, economic and political setting, um, economic development, um, market access, controlling the kinds of fish that are being caught and the kinds of markets that are opening up can be important. In the governance system, co-management where ownership and um, resource management decisions and, and uh, so on uh, are, are managed with local users, so they have control over what's going on with, it, with, their, with their resources and their, and, and their trajectories can be really successful. And gear-based management, again, is, is something that's often overlooked but can be really successful. And I'm going to quickly give you, show you a quick example of that one. So different fishing gears, so spear guns, nets, and hook and line, for example, target very, very different species and body sizes of fish on, on reefs. And that can actually be used... Uh, used to our advantage if, if we're trying to uh, maintain certain ecological processes. Here we've, we've, we've looked at the catch in the Philippines and Papua New Guinea from some artisanal fisheries, and we've looked at turf algal herbivores and macroalgal browsing herbivores, and you can see that the, the proportion of, of these fish in the catch is very different between these different gears, and that gives opportunities for manipulating which gears are used or changing the way gears are used uh, in order to maintain ecosystem processes across a much wider seascape than maybe a small marine protected area could in that particular location. Okay, so just quickly to wrap up, uh, the long-term effects of coral bleaching, it seems, may result in phase shifts in Indo-Pacific uh, reefs. Um, the best predictors we found in the Seychelles for whether phase shifts uh, occurred were initial structural complexity, coral, coral recruit density, herbivore biomass, and water depth. And many solutions uh, are likely to lay at the interface between social science and ecology. Thank you very much.